Welcome to Wash Talk. I'm your host, Brian Ankney. Today, my guest is Jason Hayes with Leadership Industries. Welcome, Jason. Welcome. It's good to be here. Well, you didn't have far to come because you're a local Akron guy, right? Yep, I am from the Canton area. Cool. Well, let's let's talk about what drove you to the car wash industry. You know, who or what inspired you to become a part of the car wash industry? I was kind of unplanned for sure. I spent 20 years in the car repair business, and I was doing a lot of studying of different leadership and management philosophies while yep. I was in that business. Needed a break, and after a few other um, opportunities to apply those philosophies that worked. I just needed a job at the time. And I went to a local car wash that needed a detail manager. I grew that 80% from their three-year average in like six months. And then I noticed that it was a smaller town. They had about 300 monthlies. And I asked what this monthly thing was. And they explained it to me. And they said, everybody in town knows about it. I said, like, I don't think everybody knows about it. So long story short, took them from 300 to 4,200 monthlies. Holy and, moly. Yeah, we have 13% of the entire city's population on our monthlies. We've been competition in town. So at that time, that's been probably almost eight, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. It was pretty unprecedented at that time, especially in a town that size. So we went from like 60,000 cars to track in like 225, somewhere around there, and started to consult. And didn't think I'd be in the car wash business, but uh, worked out really well. So I started consulting tunnels, as well as some local car washes and car washes that aren't local. And then we're in an area where there's a lot of manufacturers. So started consulting some of the car wash manufacturers. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do mostly now. I still really enjoy consulting car washes. In fact, I might start doing more of that again. Um, but started consulting car wash manufacturers, helping them with sales, marketing, and a few other things. And that's where we're at today. Cool. Let's talk about in-bay automatics. You know, that, that's a, I mean, if you drive around Akron, Ohio, there are a lot of in-bay automatics. Can you yep. tell me a little bit about the history? Like, when, when did that start becoming, you know, the, the new way to go? Yeah, and that's been a, a surprise to me because I didn't know anything about in base. Mm -hmm. um, I was a tunnel guy. I could salt tunnels and still do. I, was, I am a tunnel guy. However, uh, with some of the manufacturers I've been dealing with, I've been really well educated on in base and mm -hmm. pretty much just surprised on the opportunity for in base. And I wouldn't think anything of it, but there's a new way of washing cars with in base. And this area, however, I think throughout the country is like 20,000 in base. Holy Something boy. crazy like that because in the 80s, there was a big boom. And then they kind of went downhill. There's like ebbs and flows in the car wash business. Actually, we're at the peak now of tunnels. We might be even going over that peak. And in bays are pretty much misrepresented. Well, maybe they're not misrepresented. That's probably the wrong word. Mm -hmm. People have a bad connotation with in bays and for good reason. Your typical in bay gas station or old in bay is dark, it's dirty, it is really slow. So they don't make much money mm -hmm. in the past. And we found that if you conceptualize it like a tunnel, make it very safe, very well lit, and crank the speed way up. Uh, we can get the cars cleaner now much faster than they could bring in significant incomes. So in a past, a good in-bay may do eight to 15,000 cars a year per bay. A great in-bay would be that 18 to 22,000 car range. We're seeing easy 30,000 cars a year per bay out here. Wow. And we have a handful or even more than a handful doing 40,000. We have a couple that have done 55,000 cars out of one bay. Wow. That's a long bay. But people have no idea how much money they can make at an in-bay. They also miss the point of why customers appreciate in-bays compared to tunnels. Again, coming from the tunnel side myself, I always thought I knew customers until I realized there's a whole separate demographic. that like in-bays for various reasons. Uh, so there's a lot of money to be made in in-base. And um, yeah, if people embrace some of the tunnel concepts with in-base, I think that's kind of a future for a couple of reasons. You know, I've, I've heard people use the term tunnel intimidation. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. So I didn't really realize it, but uh, I guess I should have because I saw I helped a lot of people through the tunnel. There is a lot of people. And let's look at a couple demographics. One is elderly people. When we're shooting cars through at 80 cars, 120 cars an hour, and the loader, which is one of the most important people in the wash, is loading that person on or telling them to put it in neutral. Us car wash people do this all day. We don't think anything of it. But your, your 60-year-old or 55-year-old or 75-year-old woman gets in there. She's really intimidated to put her car in neutral because there's a lot going on. There's a car in front of you you're afraid to hit. And guess what? That tunnel guy is trying to get you real close. So 
They're already uncomfortable because they're too close to the car in front of them. They see the car behind them. They're worried about wrecking something, hitting something. And in these days, it's even much worse than it was eight years ago because even putting your car in neutral, like sometimes you have to go through a menu or figure it out, car wash oh, mode. Yeah. You can't just click it in. And when we grew up, we always knew how to put our car in neutral because our car would stall. You know, we had a beat up car and you click it in neutral, no big deal. But these days, so not only are the, the older demographic not sure how to put their car in neutral or intimidated by the timing and the rushness of it, a lot of younger people don't know how to put their car in neutral because they never had to do it. It wasn't intuitive as it is for us to click it. Again, there's just more to it. So a lot of those people, to avoid that altogether, they just want to go to an in-bay automatic where they, they pay, then they move up a little bit, and then they go into the bay, they stop their car, they can at their own time put it in park and just let this machine go around them and then leave at their own pace. Uh, there's a lot of people like that. I didn't realize how many people are intimidated by tunnels, but it's a significant amount, a significant amount. You know, there's 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 someone that I work with that I won't name, but I know she's going to watch this. And, and uh, she told me the same thing. She's like, gosh, if they ever got rid of that guy that told me where to drive, I would never be able to get on the, on the track. <laughs> yep, that's right. That's right. And that's another important factor. We'll get into the labor discussion in a little bit here, but... The loader, this is the pros and cons to tunnels, are definitely pros to tunnels and cons to tunnels, same with in-bays, but it's hit or miss. You have that guy loading, if he shows any complacency or like he doesn't care, he just made an enemy with that person. And, you know, they, they're they intimidated or they're rushed or they're screamed that, they're not coming back. Yeah. And if you don't have your loader very well trained, if they don't have some interpersonal skills, um, that could really hurt your business. And in-bay, you just cut that question mark out. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's got, that's... That's not an easy job. I mean, you're you're cold, you're wet, you're hot, you're wet. Exactly. And there's another car every 20 seconds. I mean, exactly. You've got to keep a smile on your face and you That's know, right. and make that kind of uncomfortable eye contact with every single person. Then you got to do it again 20 seconds later. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. You got to hustle. You really yeah. got to hustle for that job. And then some of those guys are prepping as well, so they're trying to pay attention to the wheels, to the front for the bugs, the dirt on the and the film on the back of the car, trying to get some pre-soak. Maybe have to pick up a different one for a wheel cleaner, and they're pushing the button and you know, people that aren't used to the car wash business, they're pushing other buttons. If the front license plate is loose, they're hitting the button. They have a trailer hitch in the back, they're hitting the button. And they have a rack on the top, they're hitting a different button. There's a lot going on in that 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they can get frustrated, you know, pretty easy. You know, people are smooth and have, you know, a comfortableness with people help, but you don't always have that, you know, so. Well, let's let's kind of come back to speed for a second. Mm -hmm. I mean, in comparison, you know, what's, what, what does the speed of the, of the throughput of the cars for an in-bay look like compared to a tunnel? So traditionally, most in-bays would be in the 9 to 12 cars an hour per bay, traditionally, for the past probably 20 years. That's how many they're going to wash. Um, some modern equipment, they might be in that 14, 15 range. There's some high-performance equipment out there that's going to be in a short bay, we're seeing current stats at 16 to 20 cars an hour in a short bay. Mm -hmm. In a long bay, 18 to 25 cars an hour in a long bay. Now, that's for the high-performance equipment. But those are the ones doing the crazy numbers. Mm -hmm. On a tunnel, typically, a tunnel can wash as many cars an hour effectively as how many feet the tunnel is long. Oh. So if you have a 100-foot tunnel, you can wash about 100 cars an hour. So there's a lot of tunnels out there that are 120, 150 feet. They're going to be in that 120 to 135 cars an hour range. I mean, some are cranking more than that, but I would say your traditional tunnel is usually doing 100 to 120 cars an hour. So the in bays are really slow. However, if you can stack two or three in bays and they can all do 20 cars an hour, whether well, then you're doing 60 cars an hour, you're open 24 hours a day, which a lot of people don't think about, and then there's no labor there. You don't have to have any labor there. So there's, there's quite a bit of difference. We do see people with four bays now. I know there's more out there, but I know of at least three businesses with four bays. So they could crank out, you know, we're talking 80 cars an hour wow. with no labor. So you're starting to get close to that tunnel number. And when you analyze it, these four bay washes can easily do 130, 160,000 cars a year. They could probably even hit 200,000 cars a year if they really had to push it, if the if the flow of the land allotted for, allotted for it. Hmm. Wow. So yeah, you could push tunnel numbers with an in bay and cut out a lot of labor. But the the trend is tunnels right now, and a lot of people don't see the potential of the in-bay doing that because a lot don't realize you can do that. And also how you set up your in-bay, they don't realize how to set it up because traditionally, again, an in-bay in the past, you pull off a street, mm -hmm. 
And you can maybe have a, a car right before that end bay and maybe stack two or three cars behind him and that's it. So that is only going to perform so well. And the reason for that is if a customer drives by, they see a car, not sure if they can get in, they're just going to keep going. Or they're going to make a left in, they can't get in, they keep going. The extreme performance in bays are typically old tunnels or set up just like a tunnel. You can stack 10 cars before the pay station, eight cars after the pay station, and there's no worries there. So they stack a lot of cars, and those are the ones that do the crazy numbers. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason I bring that up is because the people that are building modern in bays, they keep that in mind. They're going to wash an extra five, ten thousand cars a year just by setting it up and thinking on a tunnel level with throughput and stacking. Hmm. Well, I want to I want to shift gears a moment hmm. and and talk about friction. I mean, to friction or to not friction. Yep. You know, like what? Tell, tell me, tell me your thoughts on that. Great, that's a great question. So, that would be another demographic that would want in base for a specific reason. People that don't want anything touching their cars. Now, a few things have changed. So there is a lot of safe friction washes out there. They wouldn't be washing the millions of cars a year if they, if they weren't safe. However, if a customer doesn't want, if they're an enthusiast, I'm an enthusiast myself. I don't want anything touching my car. Even though I'm a car wash consultant, my daily driver, sure, I'll go through any wash because that's what I do. I consult. But my special car, I'm never going to take through a tunnel. If I would buff my car, I'm a former certified um, detailer as well, to glass, and I would go to some of my best clients, I could still tell in the sunlight. There's a little bit, you could tell you've been through a car wash. Yep. Again, now, it's important to remember, remember that every soccer mom, soccer dad cares, and they're not going to inspect their car under a microscope every single time. They just don't, it just doesn't matter. However, some of those people do care. So for one thing, you have the people who don't want anything to touch their car, so they're going to go through touchless. Uh, the A couple other scenarios is Tesla, for example, they prohibit Friction washes is right in there. If you go online and just go through their owner's manual, they don't want anything touching the car. They they want touchless, period, end of story. Hmm. The other thing that's popular right now is you buy a thirty, eighty thousand dollars car, whatever it is, or a nice big truck, whether it's used or new, and you really care about it, you're paying someone fifteen hundred, twenty five hundred dollars to put a ceramic coat on, right? And the reason it's so expensive, first of all, the ceramic coating is expensive. But before you put a ceramic coat on, if the vehicle isn't new, that detailer has to paint correct the whole vehicle. So he doesn't want to put a ceramic coat on a car that has a bunch of scratches. So yeah. you got a black truck that's giant. You know, that's going to be a 2000 plus ticket oh, yeah. to get that ceramic coated. If someone just spent that money, they do not want to go through a fiction wash. They're just not going to, not going to touch it, you know? So they want to go through a touchless as well. So you have manufacturers that are starting to go toward touchless and the back step. One, one reason for that is some of the paints are starting to change. So the Tesla, as an example, they're using water-based paints because they're in California, certain regulations. So the water-based paints aren't as robust as well as they're getting thinner. And like everything in the coast where you have environmental regulations, that typically goes inward and they'll all probably be like that soon. So there's a few reasons for, there's a few reasons that people pick touchless. Now, when it comes to clean, a lot of people ask, well, is your touchless going to be as clean as a tunnel? A lot of people try to trick me up there. And no, it's simply not going to be as clean. A car wash that's going through a friction is going to be cleaner than a touchless. However, the difference is a lot of friction washes out there, maybe right behind the mirrors where the friction can't touch or in the middle of the rear glass of an SUV or minivan where maybe the, the wraps don't come around to touch, there's, there's dirt there and they're going to see that dirt. So if someone gets out of their car, they see a part, the car is perfectly clean except for these parts, the friction didn't touch. And then they think their car isn't clean. Well, if you go through maybe an in-bay, a really good touchless in-bay, maybe the car is 10% less clean, but the whole car is exactly the same and they don't even notice. So maybe it has a hint of a film on it, depending on how fast you have your touches going, but to them it's clean and they're just, they're just out the door. A lot of car wash owners, and this is going to sound like a terrible statement, I'll probably get <laughs> smoked online for this. It's really important to have a clean car, but you don't need a perfect car. And I just went through a wash today. And this wasn't planned. I was actually on the phone and I, it came to me after, after the wash. I timed it because I typically do that. It was two minutes and 17 seconds for a touchless wash. I'm not including the dry because it was a long tunnel. I could move up and get dried. My car was very dirty. It came out extremely clean. It came out very clean, not extremely clean. Mm -hmm. I was super happy. I didn't think it was going to be as clean as it was. Now, there was a, a hint of masking. The car wash people know where that is, where your wipers are and a little bit around the wipers. So if I hit the sun, I could see there's a little bit of masking there. 
and car wash owners might go crazy. I need my car perfectly clean. I'm perfectly happy. I'm in a hurry. I don't want my car detailed. I just want two minutes in, out, and out the door. And that's what most customers want. They want their car clean or very clean. They don't need it exceptionally clean. Mm-hmm. And your average mom, your average dad, people are in a hurry. They just want in and out. They're not going to inspect the car in every little. Yeah. So the reason I bring that up is when people are adjusting their washes, that's where the time comes in. So if people are adjusting a touchless wash, well, maybe they want seven minutes, eight minutes, or five minutes to get it perfectly clean. Out here, we see cars getting darn near perfectly clean in a three-minute range. However, a lot of people are doing the two, two-and-a-half-minute range because 5% less clean they're washing a lot more cars a month, 500 yeah. or more a month or 1,000 more a month, and no one's calling. No one's complaining. We notice. The average customer doesn't notice a hint less clean. So just something to keep in mind. That's kind of a hot-button statement. A lot of people are going to argue with that. But we're here to help people make money. And, again, if the customer's happy, they wouldn't be the, doing the numbers they're doing if the customer wasn't happy. So it's just something to keep in mind. I want to. I also want to talk about memberships. I mean, mm-hmm. the the – Memberships, how many, I mean, I don't even know how many memberships I have. You know, you've got television memberships. You've got, you know, supplements that come from Amazon. You've got a car wash membership. Yep. You've got a gym membership. That's right. It seems like every business in America wants to give you a membership right now, and it's really changed the way car washes operate. Tell me tell me a little bit about, you know, how, how, how you feel memberships are going to continue to change the car wash industry and where, where it's going. That's a great question. And with the car washing, there's actually more benefits than what you would see at the gym or other places, especially online memberships. Have so, you been, have you been watching me at the gym? <laughs> no, I don't even know what that is. Oh, no, 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 you said that there's more oh, benefits oh, gotcha. than at the gym. Yeah, that's People true. always say they go to the gym, they don't see benefits, right? <laughs> and that's hilarious. You're right. And there is a certain gym company that I modeled a lot of when I was doing the monthlies. I, I train monthlies. That's my specialty is training monthlies, mm-hmm. teaching people how to sell. That's what my main consulting part is, is teaching how to sell monthlies. So I love this subject. For, and for InBase, it's even more important. So there's a couple aspects of that. For one, is continual income. Um, it's really easy to run a business when you know how much is coming in a month, no matter what. Mm-hmm. Especially where we're at in Ohio, it's raining, it doesn't rain, it's snowing, it doesn't snow. Our weather is is anything in this area, Michigan, Ohio, Indiana, New York, upstate New York. The weather's all over the place. Mm-hmm. And you could have in the past, you know, I talked to owners who've done, done this 20, 30 years. You could have great years, terrible years. Um, in fact, we'll bring something up in a minute here. But uh, with the memberships, it smooths all that out. Mm-hmm. You know, the ebbs and flows, instead of the waves going like that, good and bad years, it's just kind of like this. There, it's easy for the customer to know they're only paying so much a month. It's a lot easier for them to budget. There's, I can geek out on this forever because this is my specialty. There's habit-forming loops in the brain and the subconscious, that's what I study a lot, that keep people on. If you mm-hmm. have a solid customer... The competition has to be like 90% better. At least that's what studies show for them to go somewhere else. It takes work to go somewhere else. So they don't want to unless you really make them mad. Mm -hmm. And the other thing with memberships is it really smooths out the hourly flow. So if typically you get hit between 4 to 6 p.m., if a member goes by and they see it's full, they'll just come back tomorrow or the next day, and they're not worried about it. Guess what? If they weren't a member, they go to the wash down the road. Or they won't get a wash at all. So either you didn't make money or you send them to your competition. Well, they're already a member. They don't even think about it, but I'll just come back tomorrow. Yeah. No big deal there. The most important issue, though, that's typically overlooked is the psychological. So activity breeds more activity. If an in-base, let's go to the in-base for a second, has only 350 monthlies. If you do the math, they still come in so far. The data we have shows that the in bay frequency is the same as a tunnel. So far, that's what we're seeing. And there might be more data out there that I don't have, but I have a fair amount. So the frequency is three to four times a month, at least in this area, similar to a tunnel wash. So if you have 350 monthlies, let's say they come in four times a month. If you do the math, every 15 minutes, a car is getting washed that wouldn't be getting washed if they didn't have a monthly. Why that matters. Psychologically, I'll bring up two scenarios. When we're doing something we do every day, driving is a good example, we get on a cruise control mentality, our brain wants to use as least calories as possible. We'll be driving by, we know a car wash is there, we don't even think about it. We need something of novelty to click our brain on. If we see a car coming out washing or a car coming out dripping or someone at the vacuum, and then we immediately think, oh, then you actually pay attention to it. If this just there, you're not paying attention to it. Mm -hmm. So a car coming out every 15 minutes that wouldn't be, 
it adds to their single pay. Not only brings your monthlies up, but your single pay typically stays the same or even we've seen it even their single pay doubles even with monthlies. Oh, wow. Just because activity breeds more activity. Um, I'll put one more study. This is a really interesting study that people in car washing should think about is one of the colleges or universities did a, a study of a musician. So a musician that had a jar, right? He was on the street playing guitar. And they had the jar empty and they were taking a percentage of how many people put money in the jar. Mm-hmm. I don't remember the exact percentages, but I remember the, the concept of it. It was like, yeah, 4% of people put money in the jar. So then they left the jar with money in it and wanted to see what percentage. It was like 8 or 12%. It did not go up that much if they saw money in it. However, they studied if someone watched another person put money in it, it went to like 60%. Oh, wow. it, it was a ridiculous jump by watching someone else do it. And the mentality is the same with a car wash. So if you see a car wash or no car wash, you're not paying attention. But if you see someone else actually doing the activity, then like, oh, yeah, I need to vacuum out my car. Oh, yeah, I need to get my car washed. So the monthlies are so much more powerful than people realize, not only for income, but the psychological impact of getting more people to your site, getting them to pull in. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of like when you're traveling and you know, somebody that's traveling is always going to go to the restaurant that's crowded versus the restaurant that's empty. You know, like absolutely because you, you, you assume that those other people must know something you don't know. And so a busy car wash is going to be more attractive to me than a car wash that's empty all the time. Absolutely right. So I'm going to think there's something wrong with it. That's right. Yeah. You and I travel a lot. If we, if we love local restaurants, yeah. but if we go by a local place and there's like two or three cars, no, <laughs> yeah, we're not no. going there. No, there's no. no way. I'm not taking a chance on that. Yeah. And the other thing, actually, just to touch on this, what you said that has a lot to do with like fear mechanisms. This isn't the right podcast to go on off of this tangent, but it's just something to keep in mind. What it is, is stability. It's confidence. If we see something that nothing's happening, fear means no. If I'm not sure about something, that means no. And especially for different demographics, uh, the female demographic especially, they want to be where other people are for safety reasons. And it makes total sense. So mm-hmm. more activity, the more they're going there. No activity, that's creepy, right? And yep. you're not going anyplace creepy. That's all there is to it. And that is another reason typical in bays in the past haven't done well because they have a real creepy vibe unless you modernize it. So, well, I want to I want to uh, I want to circle back to something you brought up earlier. You talked a couple in a couple of the answers that you said something about a long bay, mm-hmm. and and I and I've heard you speak about stacking in a long bay before. Can you explain what that is and what the benefits to it can be? Yeah, there's two major benefits. Well, there's two things to benefit from. There's stacking, and then there's a long bay. Two separate things. So a long bay. I typically call a long bay between like 55 to 75 feet. So a typical in bay, I'm just going to use my hands as gestures here. You pull in, the machine goes around you, the dryers are right here, and you slowly creep out the dryer. So they quit washing your car, the dryers kick on, you slowly creep out. A long bay, your car is done washing, the dryers are over here, you move up to the dryers, the next car could come in and start washing, while this car then slows down. The longer the bay, the typically the better it works because a customer sees that timer kick on and they the fear hustle. missing out. Yeah, I want yeah. I want every ounce of every I don't second. I fly through because I don't want to wait for it. But a lot of people <laughs> they want every second, so they hit the gas, get out of the way, then slow down for the dryers. Next car come in, start washing. That typically adds like five to seven cars an hour. And annualized, I usually see, you know, probably ten thousand cars more a year per bay on a long bay. And very similar, I would say five to 10,000, depending on a few factors. But the stacking is another part. So stacking is putting cars after the pay station. So typical in-bay for the past 20, 30 years, you pull up the pay station, you pay your money, the in-bay is right here. You pay, then you go in. There's a few things that's happening here. One, customers are always afraid of losing their money, and rightfully so, because machines have let them down, vending machines, everything has let them down over time. Yep. So a lot of them don't pay until that car leaves. So they just sit there waiting. After that car is done and they see the thing kick on, then they'll pay. So if you stack, if you put your pay station back one full car length and they have a gate there, that alone, two cars an hour, no problem. And I had a guy text me just the other day, hey, I finally did what you guys suggested. I put my pay station back, put a gate in. I immediately picked up two cars an hour. That was his exact text. So when someone pays, they're waiting to pay. The gate goes up. They, they wait here. 
and they're waiting, this car goes through, then they go in and this customer has confidence because there's a wait sign over here that they're gonna pay and the gate's gonna go up and there. So that's part of stacking. The other part is, as we touched on, is getting onto the lot. It goes back to the, the psychological aspect of fear. People don't wanna take a chance of getting hit from behind or not sure if they can get into a parking lot. And when you only stack a couple cars, you're going to be a lot slower because that car is just going to drive by. They're not going to come back if they see they can't get into the parking lot and your typical old in bay only can stack a couple of cars. Mm -hmm. If you set up your lot where you can stack a lot of cars, they're going to get in line. They don't mind being in line. They're going to get on their phone and then they're going to shoot right through. So I, as one example, locally here, we have a wash with a 14,000 car traffic count, exact same machine. 14,000 car traffic count and a shopping traffic, which is what you want. So there's, there's McDonald's, there's a Wendy's, everything is real close. And a couple of years ago, I'm, I'm doing a couple of years ago because there's apples to apples comparison. They washed 18,000 cars, 14,000 car traffic count, washed 18,000 cars, shorter bay, no stacking. Two miles down the road, traffic count of 7,500. So just about half the traffic count mm -hmm. washed 33,000 cars out of one bay. So half the traffic count washed about twice the cars. It has stacking and the long bay. Wow. And it's not even shopping traffic. It's just commuter traffic. So it just shows this one wash can only stack two cars after the pay station. The other one could stack probably eight cars before the pay station, probably six cars after the pay station. So they just get in line and they they're wait. in line. Yep. yep. They're ready to go. Yep. You know, I mean, I, there's a there's a wash by my house that uh, the, the people will get in line and they, they come out into one of the lanes of traffic. And I always think like, well, you know, like that would make me so nervous because- if people are all looking at their phone while they're driving, I mean, I don't want to get rear-ended and then hit the car in front of me. Exactly. And now now I'm in a rental car for two months or, or yep. even worse, my car's totaled, you know? Yep. And you're thinking, and you thought about it consciously. The truth is most people think about this subconsciously. If they're just uncomfortable, they keep moving. With uncomfortable, When you're uncomfortable with anything, your yeah. typical response for safety reasons is no. So if they're just not sure about anything, you just keep going. That's just the way it works. You're not sure you're going to say no to the sale. You're not sure you're going to say no and just keep driving. Well, I want to I want to talk about people for a minute. Mm -hmm. I mean, every business in America right now is having trouble, you know, finding labor. And the car wash industry is no different. Um, I mean, it seems like a lot of the people I'm interviewing are talking about a robot that can replace a person or a machine that doesn't need a person. I mean, for a for a car wash that 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 is looking for people, do you have any advice? And for a, somebody who is building a car wash right now. What would, be, would your advice be on, on how labor intensive they should create their business to be? Yeah. So, boy, that's, <laughs> that's a question I can speak an hour about. <laughs> awesome. To just touch the subject a little bit of how to hire, um, I'm a big fan of Patrick Lencioni's Hungry, Humble, Smart, The Ideal Team Player. Every car wash owner should read that book. Every car wash owner should use his hiring practices. Basically, hungry, humble, smart. Even entry-level people, if they don't have those three attributes, I wouldn't hire them up to CEO level. You don't hire anybody unless they have those three attributes. That's what I go by. I also have all my my potential clients. I have the whole team take the Myers-Briggs and I suggest to my clients have them do the same. What that does is help put the right person in the right seat. So if you want someone talking to a customer all day, you want someone extroverted that's actually going to get energy. Someone like me. I get energy from talking with people. I can mm -hmm. talk all day long. Someone that's going to be a loader, you know, he needs to be consistent. So you want someone who's real consistent. Um, so I use a lot of Myers-Briggs uh, philosophy when I'm hiring. That's something to keep in mind there. Everybody's a little bit different. I like to be very flexible with people. That helps keep staff as well because car wash industry, even throughout the country, is weather dependent. So if I'm flexible with them, they'll be flexible with me. Flexibility, and a lot of studies have shown that that is a large factor for especially younger people. Um, I know Chick-fil-A as one example, they did a study that no one else did. And that was like the top of the list. Just be flexible. Mm -hmm. And if you're flexible with them, with school, with even younger people, you know, back in the day, we just worked no matter what. And you had to work, you had to work. Now people want off for reasons that we would never want off, but that's a change in society. That's okay. If you just give them off different times, we want dedicated people, but things have changed. A lot of younger people take their friends and family more serious than we did. And that's not a bad thing necessarily. That's just the way it is. So being flexible helps out a lot. Um, however, when it comes to in-bays, it's still really hard to hire people. So that gets into the in-bay subject. Mm -hmm. With the tunnels, you have to have so many people run. You have to have a loader or two. You have to, you not have to, but typically want someone selling. 
if you're, if you're doing it right, you have a manager, you have people cleaning up the lot. So minimum, most tunnels have a minimum of three people on the lot at all time, typically. With an in-bay, I've seen them with people all the time, but 90% of them have nobody there. Check the vacuums, check the, depending how busy you are, check the vacuums and trash once, twice, three times a day, and that's it. So that really allows you flexibility to have one, two, three, four, five in-bays. You could have one employee just checking stuff, you know, keep an eye on machines, doing maintenance, or just one college kid going there two or three times a day, checking the garbage and the vacuums. Another thing about employees and when it comes to automation is I teach, like my goal is to teach everybody about monthly how to sell monthly plans. That's what I do for, for my business. And certain technology companies would say, hey, you don't need anybody there. What I found, if you're getting this many sales with nobody, you can get this many sales with an okay person. You can get that many sales with a great person. The problem is, if you have a person below average, you're actually going to lose sales. Yeah. And so do you want to take the chance? And what kind of business owner do you want to be? So we have a lot of, if you have a retail a business owner or a manager with retail experience, this is going to be a lot easier for them to manage a hire because that's their background. If you have a more of an investor type or even private equity type where they just want to automate the daylights out of everything, mm -hmm. you can still get effective sales by not having anybody there. And in some ways, you'll get more effective sales without anybody there if you can't find good people, if you're not really good at managing people and you have that person that's on their phone or show complacency, you know, that complacency is the killer of a business. If you have someone at the pay station trying to sell with complacency or the loader that has complacency, you're doing worse than not having anybody there at all. And that's where owners are starting to have this conversation. Like, hey, we know if it's well-managed, we can crush this place, but how much energy do we want to put in this? Do we just want to have a place with no labor at all? And we can still do this many numbers with no labor? That's really, really appealing. Yeah. Especially to investor type or especially in the in-bay business, because there's a lower barrier of entry for, for in-bays, we have people in their 60s, 70s, 50s retiring. They make great money. They're looking for a place to put their money. But they don't want to deal with people anymore. And they spent their whole life managing people or working really hard. And the talent pool, compared to what it was years ago, it's just, in general, harder to find people. They want a giant vending machine. And this allows that. Um, so they're, they're really keen to just um, having a no-employee type site or low employee type site. Cool. Actually, my, this question is going to be kind of difficult because we've okay. kind of come at it from almost every other question we've touched on it. Yeah. But I, I wanted to ask you about the future. So mm -hmm. technology and automation, you know, we've kind of really well covered, you know, kind of the options and where we are today. But what about 10 years from now? What's a car wash going to look like in 10 years or 20 years? Like, what do you see coming down the line for us? Yeah, I look at things. It is a great question. It is a hard question. I see things only going more toward automation. Uh, last year, I was at the Automate Conference in Detroit. This is something I, I keep my ear to. Uh -huh. I just love the technology and where it's going. And there's a few things to look for. First of all, automation is getting much more advanced. It's mm -hmm. just, so automation is going this way. The labor pool is going this way. I look at things uh, almost like a, like a raging river. The raging river is it's harder and harder to get talent. I don't see, there might be tributaries that go off the river, but no one's going to go against the river. Like, I don't see any reason why the labor is going to change. I mean, do you? Do you see anything that's going to change the labor around? No. So if it's going one direction, it's getting harder and harder and harder and harder to find good labor. I don't see it changing. So owners are just going to go to automation. It just cuts out the hassle. And especially entry-level labor that's getting the most hardest to find um, so yeah, it's going to be automated and that's the only direction to go. I think actually that's one reason why people are going to start looking at in a little bit more. I personally think that has a stronger future. Um, another thing that happened with labor is, is COVID is an example of a black swan that gives people pause about labor. Um, I'm one of those guys. I w was called consulting tunnels. At that time, a lot of them were local and every state's a little bit different and I was also, what you guys do now, I was running Facebook for a bunch of tunnels. And at the time, people were very polarized, right? Either you stay open, you stay closed. People were really animated one way, animated the other. So I told my clients, you know, just don't post anything because no matter what we post, we're going to make somebody angry. Yep. So just, just stop posting. I put myself out of a job. Um, and genuinely, I lost almost 100% of my income during COVID. Now, the in-bay guys, 
a lot of them stayed open and a lot of them that weren't open, if they would talk to the municipality a little bit and say, I'm a no contact type site, they could open. But with people around, those, if they weren't essential, which some car washes were, some weren't, depends again on the county, the state you were in, they got shut down. So I like the idea when it comes to automation is it's a little more future-proof, in my opinion, is a little less risk mm -hmm. with having just a giant vending machine, especially with no contact. You talk about automation, people using apps, scan it, or RFID, you flip through, you don't have to touch anything. Uh, so that's really appealing for someone who got hit hard with yeah. COVID, you know, personally. It, it made me think twice. If I was going to open a business, any other business or any other sector, I, that would be my mind. Like, what happens if there's another something like that where I can't have employees yeah. and I want to automate all the way. So I think the people are thinking about those things and they're considering automation and, and liabilities. People don't talk about liabilities enough with a car wash and with employees. It's just getting more and more expensive for employees. And that's a, a shame in many ways. And I'm not saying I'm a fan of not being able to have a lot of employees. I'm a fan of the direction it's going. I am just saying this is the reality of, of where we're at right now. Yeah. Well, and I mean, if you, if you look at some of the things in robotics and some of, some of the automation that's coming, it moves fast, which means if a person's working directly next to it, you, there are probably are considerations. I mean, especially a person who's doing the same thing all day long, every day, they only have to forget what they're doing one time and they can yeah. get seriously injured. Yeah. Automation is crazy. Uh, speed, which you talked about. I have some videos I'll show you after this. The speed of some of this is blinding what some of these machines can do. It's you just can't comprehend it unless you see it in person. And that's going to come to car washing, the accuracy of AI. You know, like one thing that's very difficult right now, if you run a tunnel, not so much an in base, but if you have a really high quality tunnel, you want the car super clean and you live in a rural area, you know, the inner fender wells, right? So you have to kind of reach up underneath and go around the wheel, the inner fender wells, get the mud off. Mm -hmm. Machines can't do that yet. Yet. In fact, I think there is a machine that might be able to. Um, but that kind of stuff, it's only a matter of time. That's all going to be automated. The car is going to come out great and you don't need anybody there. There's just no reason to think otherwise. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I've, I've heard, I've heard of, you know, even robotics that will clean the inside of the car, which is just mind boggling. You know, that is you, you have, you have a, a conveyor belt that moves the, the car and then the robot is actually on the moving conveyor belt and it's reaching in the car, cleaning the inside of the car. Like, I, I totally want to see that. That is crazy. But you probably can't, you definitely can't be in the car. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Cause yeah. Because that robot will get you, you know? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> if they can figure out a robot to do interior windows, we're all going to be much happier. That's the toughest part, of cleaning the inside of a car. But, you know, uh, that, that, that's probably, yeah, I mean, that, that would probably be super difficult for a robot. But, yeah. I mean, it's probably coming. It I mean, probably is coming. If, yeah. I mean, if a robotic arm can fix a space shuttle, yeah, it, it's just a matter of time before yeah. it can clean glass. Yep. Advancements are accelerating like crazy. Again, there's no reason to think otherwise. It's just going that direction. And you cut out, again, you cut out a lot of liabilities. It's a better business model. Again, may not be a fan of it, but it's a better business model for people that are looking to get into it, thinking of modern ways of doing it. Well, Jason, is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience before we say goodbye? Yeah, there's one attribute about monthlies I totally forgot to talk about. This year, um, as of shooting this, we had the worst... I would say in the northern part of the United States, northern central. So from Kansas to the east coast, it was the worst winter we've ever seen in car washing. Or at least the people I've talked to, I've heard either it's the worst I've ever seen or the worst I've seen in 20 years, as in income. So all these states typically, especially in the northeast, we rely on salt as our busiest season is the winter. And this year, nothing worked out right. We didn't get much salt. If we did get salt, it rained the next day and washed all the salt away. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have those dry weeks where the cars would get salty. They get washed. The second they leave, They're the salt is statically, you know, <laughs> it just sticks to it. So they come right back the next day and then we get them on a monthly. It was the worst they've ever seen. The stats we have now, this is in Bay, but we've, we've done a little bit of a survey with our connections that we, we know. The people that weren't, that weren't running monthlies, they lost from the first quarter of 2022 to the first quarter of 2023. They were down 35 to 55%. Wow. And, and revenue. Yeah, which is a terrible hit. Those who had monthlies were down 8 to 15% in revenue. That's it. Wow. It's, it's smoothed it out. It's just much less risk when you run a monthly. And um, that is something a lot of people don't think about. In fact, I know personally of people who were 
who kept pushing the monthlies away. And then after this first quarter, like, okay, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let me see about that. Talk to me about the monthly now. Now I'm starting to believe. Um, so that is something for people to keep in mind. Uh, it really helps give you more security in your business, and all of us want more security if we can get it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, even if you if you if you have a membership, you're you're not likely to cancel it. I mean, like. If, if I'm on the road for three weeks, I don't like cancel my Netflix and then sign up again when I get That's home. That's right. You know? That's it's, right. If, if it's there, you kind of set it, you forget it. And, yep. And when you do want to wash, if it's one wash or if it's five washes because it's really salty, you just have it covered. It's a box that's checked. Yep. That's right. Especially if everything's priced properly, you'll have no problems at all. Great. Well, thank you for coming today. Yeah, appreciate it, Brian. It's been a good time. Yeah, I got to let you go because I think I asked you every question that I know about the car wash industry. I think, well, I don't know, what was it, we have 12, 14 questions? <laughs> yeah, something like that. Well, that's what we're here for. It's a lot of fun. Cool. I love educating people. So thank you for coming. Thank you. And thank you for taking the time to join us for this episode of Wash Talk. I'm your host, Brian Angney. Today, my guest has been Jason Hayes. We hope to see you again soon. <laughs> Thank you.